Hello, everybody. Congratulations on the Porter. You know, it's been advertised for so long and I was just so keen to see it. It, it was like this huge thing that was coming up and, and I was very pleased to see that it lived up to expectations. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you. It's really good. Um, and I wanted to talk first of all about the role of women. I know this is mostly about the men, but I just want to say how appreciative I was that the women are shown as um, liberated in their own sense, in their own world, the way white women were not liberated and that they were powerful, they had jobs, they were gang leaders, <laughs> you know, they were, they had big personalities and they did things with their lives. Did you research in any, into any characters that sort of gave you insights into that? Uh, Lauren, yeah. can we start with you? Um, I'll say that uh, I, I watched a lot of documentaries and I, I found any video that I could about showgirls during that time. I also watched the movie Idlewild because it was in a similar era of dancing and of music and um, of a singer, you know, who was like singing at a club trying to trying to get the same stardom. You know, so I, I watched things like that to inspire me and help me kind of shape who I wanted uh, Lucy to be. That's very cool. And uh Olaniki, Olanike. Yes. Sorry, I've been working on it for two days. <laughs> Olanike, your character is fearsome. I mean, I look at you, you look like a nice regular person. She is threatening. She's almost omnisexual. There is so much going on with her. How on earth did you find her mm. in yourself? Oh, um... Well, I have to tell the truth about some things about myself. And uh, if you look at a character like Queenie, genuinely, I'd want to be her. At least, like, you know, I want to grow up to be her because she, <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, part of aspects about me, I do like it when some people fear me, especially when I walk into the room and I need to do business. I do like yeah. that aspect of don't fuck with me, pardon my French. Um, because for so long, um, Black women have been taken advantage of and 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 not given the um, the credentials or the the due diligence of all of what they've done for history, right? Because men usually are put in the forefront of that, but um, black women have been literally the foundation of a lot of change. And so the fact that I get to play a woman that makes the change that she wants to see, you know, that's, it was, it wasn't far, it wasn't far for me to go to find that inspiration. I can find that pretty much in most black women, you know? Wow. Yeah, I can look to my, my mother, my, my aunt that even dared to come from Jamaica to start a life and build here in Canada and what they've done with it. And so I've seen it my whole life of making your own way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like it wasn't, it wasn't far from me. I, I did uh, see some films, of course, with very powerful women, but I looked to my own family because that's who I've always had shoulders to stand on. Wow, well put, thank you very much. And Mona, your character, I mean, you have to sing, you have to be who she is. You have to, uh, she has a lot, you have a lot of responsibility. And I'm wondering if um, that plays into the way she came out. She just seems to be, um, she's just a huge story in and of herself. So if you could tell me how you found her, I'd be very interested. That was directed at me, right? So are you yeah. count? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I did a lot of research about Black women during that time period. And I also um, have been fortunate enough to work on other period shows. And I think in particular, my experience in the Black Mysteries, playing a character, Rebecca James, who was pursuing a career in the medical field, but got stopped um, as a result of you know, systemic racism and overt racism, uh, that sort of almost unconsciously laid the groundwork for where I wanted to take Marlene 
because um, on this show, I had the opportunity to um, play a character that is so much more dynamic and it has experiences in so many different spaces. So not only do we see Marlene in her home, we see her out doing her work as a Black cross nurse and see her with her friends. And so um, for me, it was about bringing the, the quiet ambition that I had learned about and read about of so many Black women prior to the 1920s and then moving it forward. So um, one of the things that I read about was um, how in the UNIA uh, movement, Black women were afforded so much more power. They were allowed to be leaders within the community. They were allowed to be authorities in ways that white women weren't in, say, the Red Cross. And so um, those histories and those specific stories were something that really informed how I how I created my own. You know, th there is so much learning in this in the series. Um, I, I think it's an eye opener for a lot of people. And I wonder, Amo, with your um, participation in, in the film in front and behind the camera, did you feel sometimes the material was was painful to you? Yes. Sometimes the material was painful, but I didn't I didn't approach it with that. I approached it with Junior's desire to rebel against the time, you know? And I approached it with this the the, the desire to be active about your life. Um but there is a sadness that I don't want to give away too much, but there's a sadness that happened at war with these two black men that were at war and this promise that that going away and becoming a soldier was given to them this this sense of if you go away at least from junior's part if you go away and fight for your country you will come home a hero and when he comes home he's skilled he is um someone that's taken lives on behalf of his country but he's rejected he's marginalized and 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 more than that he's spat on and called you know He's, he's treated just above an animal. So there is this kind of um, broken nature about what life can be. And I think Junior is constantly pulling himself away from succumbing to that, um, that deep melancholy about the world around him. He's so he's being active, but when, he, when he's still, he's pulled into the reality of his world, the reality of his son, there's also another thing that I always established that in some way he feels a little cursed or is it his fault that, you know, his son, he went away when his son was born to, to create a better life. And he comes back and his son's got all these, you know, um, these, these development issues, you know, at least that's what, how he perceives it at the time. And with all of that, he just carries the burden and weight of, did he make the right decision or not? Um, and, I think the thing that keeps him um, particularly grounded is his wife and his and his son, and without that, he barely has something to uh, live for. You know, he's fighting for that. He's fighting to keep himself. Um, that's his grounded. That's that's the thing that grounds him, but that's also the thing that injects life into him. Otherwise, he has to face the fact that the world is is indeed abhorrent in the way it is. He uses hope as a vehicle to travel away from the melancholy and reality of what life is, you know? Wow, well put, well put. Uh, Ronnie, the ice incident is horrifying. Was there a precedent in history or was it, you know, an educated guess, that whole sequence and, and the tragedy? Um. Well, I'm not too sure, I think, the the writers would be able to speak more on on that um in truth um but yeah uh yeah i don't know if i could truly answer that question oh okay well I, it shows us the way that black men who were employed with reputable companies mm -hmm. were were treated so abysmally yeah and um, I mean, how long did it go on that way? Oh, well, 
that's that's the the thing or the catalyst or one of the catalysts to to why Zeke was fighting for unionization or why porters were fighting for unionization is just how they were mistreated, right? They were underpaid. They worked very long hours. Um, and it pretty much was a continuation of slavery in a sense. You know what I mean? They were looking, black men were the ideal candidates for Porter because they were coming off of right. slavery, right? So they whatever they can get, they're going to take at that point, right? And the way that um, society at the time was viewing a porter for black men is that it was the, the cream of the crop. But in actuality, it was uh, the complete opposite because they were invisible people that weren't respected. Um, uh, in many cases, <laughs> um, the, where they slept was in a smoking room. Just just like it, it, in reality, to, to just give you some reality of it like you know you have three hours uh, out of a 72 hour run and you would have to spend it not even laying down on a bed but sitting down in a smoke room for three hours yeah but but you probably wouldn't get the the full extent of the three hours oh my god it just gets worse and worse and that terrible scene where the man is showing his inner lip that just broke my heart <sighs> just yeah. broke my heart yeah yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I do appreciate your time. I, I've enjoyed meeting you. Thank you and good luck. And see season two. Yes. 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 I like that energy.